Every seed is a miniature miracle. God has programmed the tiny sequoia seed to become the largest tree on earth, reaching nearly 300 feet tall and weighing many tons. God has designed the humble apple seed to yield a bounty of delicious fruit for years to come. And God has planned a multitude of seeds to produce spectacular blossoms in abundance. Consider the many varieties of seeds. As stated in Genesis, each seed always produces after its own kind. And just as the Lord intended, the fruits and byproducts that they bear have supplied the needed food and resources for man and his environment. In the first chapter of Genesis, God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit that yields fruit according to its kind whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. So the Creator made life with the ability to reproduce after its kind. Plants produce seed. This answers the question, which came first, the seed or the plant? Clearly, God created plant life with the seed in itself. Seeds are masterpieces of micro-miniaturization. <laughs> Inside each seed is a little baby, a little embryonic plant. It's already got leaves, you know, and a stem and a root. It's surrounded by a seed coat that protects it and filled with all kinds of receptors listening in to environmental signals so it knows what temperature, what moisture conditions, how much oxygen. All these things have to be present before it will sprout. And the first seeds we find as fossils look just like the seeds that we have today. The seed is the first reproductive structure God made on creation day three, and it's the way living things ever since have multiplied after kind. Today, scientists have discovered what Scripture stated all along. Inside the unassuming seed is life itself. Contained within are living cells, tiny factories of amazing complexity. No scientist has been able to build a synthetic seed, and no seed is simple. Seeds are programmed to remain dormant until water and warmth are available. Who installed this ability to monitor temperature and humidity? Who determined the proper time for the seed to germinate? Who told the root, you must go down, and the stem, you must head upward? Do you see the guiding hand of our all-loving Creator? In order to sprout and thrive, seeds require the proper soil nutrients, the ideal properties found in water, the correct frequency spectrum of light, the right atmosphere, and the necessary pollinators. All of these must have been in place from the beginning in order for seeds to yield a harvest of blessings for mankind. The engine of life is linkage. Everything is linked. Nothing is self-sufficient. Water and air are inseparable united in life and for our life on earth. Sharing is everything. They grow unhurriedly toward the sun that nourishes their foliage. The power to capture light's energy. They store it and feed off it turning it into wood and leaves, which then decompose into a mixture of water, mineral, vegetable, and living matter. And so, gradually, soils are formed. Soils teem with the incessant activity of microorganisms feeding, digging, aerating, and transforming. They make the humus, the fertile layer to which all life on land is linked. How many species are we aware of? A tenth of them? A hundredth, perhaps? 
What do we know about the bonds that link them? Families of animals form, united by customs and rituals that are handed down through the generations. In the great adventure of life on Earth, every species has a role to play. Every species has its place. None is futile or harmful. They all balance out. Three quarters of the varieties developed by farmers over thousands of years have been wiped out. As far as the eye can see, Fertilizer below, plastic on top. The greenhouses of Almeria in Spain are Europe's vegetable garden. A city of uniformly sized vegetables waits every day for the hundreds of trucks that will take them to the continent's supermarkets. The more a country develops, the more meat its inhabitants consume. How can growing worldwide demand be satisfied without recourse to concentration camp style cattle farms. Faster and faster, like the life cycle of livestock which may never see a meadow, manufacturing meat faster than the animal has become a daily routine. In these vast food lots trampled by millions of cattle, not a blade of grass grows. A fleet of trucks from every corner of the country brings in tons of grain, soy meal, and protein-rich granules that will become tons of meat. The result is that it takes 100 liters of water to produce one kilogram of potatoes, 4,000 liters for one kilo of rice, and 13,000 liters for one kilo of beef. Not to mention the oil guzzled in the production process and transport. Our agriculture has become oil powered. It feeds twice as many humans on Earth, but has replaced diversity with standardization. It has offered many of us comforts we could only dream of but it makes our way of life totally dependent on oil. This is the new measure of time. Our world's clock now beats to the rhythm of these indefatigable machines tapping into the pocket of sunlight. The whole planet is attentive to these metronomes of our hopes and illusions. The same hopes and illusions that proliferate along with our needs increasingly insatiable desires and profligacy. We know that the end of cheap oil is imminent, but we refuse to believe it. ...are no longer counted in miles, but in minutes. The automobile shapes new suburbs where every home is a castle, a safe distance from the asphyxiated city centers and where neat rows of houses huddle around dead-end streets. The model of a lucky few countries has become a universal dream preached by televisions all over the world. Even here in Beijing, it is cloned, copied, and reproduced in these formatted houses that have wiped pagodas off the map. All living matter is linked. Water, air, soil, trees. The world's magic is right in front of our eyes. Trees breathe groundwater into the atmosphere as light mist. They form a canopy that alleviates the impact of heavy rains. The forests provide the humidity that is necessary for life. They store carbon containing more than all the Earth's atmosphere. They are the cornerstone of the climactic balance on which we all depend. The trees of the primary forests provide a habitat for three quarters of the planet's biodiversity. That's to say, of all life on Earth. These forests provide the remedies that cure us. The substances secreted by these plants 
can be recognized by our bodies. Our cells talk the same language. We are of the same family. But in barely 40 years, the world's largest rainforest, the Amazon, has been reduced by 20%. Barely 20 years ago, Borneo, the fourth largest island in the world, was covered by a vast primary forest. At the current rate of deforestation, it will have totally disappeared within 10 years. Living matter bonds water, air, earth, and the sun. In Borneo, this bond has been broken in what was one of the Earth's greatest reservoirs of biodiversity. And for paper has increased five-fold in 50 years. One forest does not replace another forest. At the foot of these eucalyptus trees, nothing grows because their leaves form a bed that is toxic for most other plants. They grow quickly, but exhaust water reserves. Forestation, especially for oil palm, to provide biofuel for the Western countries is what's causing these problems. And those are the peat swamp forest on 20 meters of peat, the largest accumulation of organic material in the world. When you open this for growing oil palms, you're creating CO2 volcanoes that are emitting so much CO2 that my country is now the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world after China and the United States. And we don't have any industry at all. We dealt with the fire, and then only we started doing the reforestation by combining agriculture with forestry. Only then we set up the infrastructure and management and the monitoring. But we made sure that in every step of the way, the local people were going to be fully involved so that no outside forces would be able to interfere with that, that the people would become the defenders of that forest. So we do this is what it looked like for three months. For three months, the automatic lights outside did not go off because it was that dark. We lost all the crops. No children gained weight for over a year. They lost 12 IQ points. It was a disaster for orangutans and people. So these fires are really the first thing to work on. Because this forest is now creating its own rain. This nearby city of Balikpapan has a big problem with water. It's for 80% surrounded by seawater, and we have now a lot of intrusion there. Now we looked at the clouds above this forest. So we looked at the reforestation area, semi-open area, and open area. And look at these images. Yeah, I just run them very quickly through. In the tropics, raindrops are not formed from ice crystals, like is the case in the temperate zones. You need the trees with micists, chemicals that come out of the leaves of the trees that initiate the raindrops. So you create a cool place where clouds can accumulate, and you have the trees to initiate the rain. And look, there's now 11.2% more clouds. That was already after three years. If you look at the rainfall, it was already up 20% at that time. But let's look at the next year. And you can see that that trend is continuing, where first we had a small cap of higher rainfall. That cap is now widening and getting higher. And if we look at the rainfall pattern above Sambotje Lestari, it used to be the driest place. But now you see consistently a peak of rain forming there. So you can actually change the climate. Followed nature, and nature doesn't know monocultures, but a natural forest 
has multi layers. That means that both in the ground and above the ground, it can make better use of the available light. It can store more carbon in the system. It can provide more functions, but it's more complicated. It's not that simple, and you have to work with the people. So what we do is also, just like nature, we grow fast planting trees, and underneath that, we grow the slower growing primary rainforest trees of a very high diversity that can optimally use that light. And then what is just as important, get the right fungi in there that will grow into those leaves, bring back the nutrients to the roots of the trees that have just dropped that leaf within 24 hours. And they become like nutrient pumps. So you need the bacteria to fix nitrogen. And without those microorganisms, you won't have any performance at all. So this is after one year. And this is after two years. And that's green. If we look from the tower, this is when we start attacking the grass. We plant in the seedlings, mixed with the bananas, the papayas, all the crops for the local people. But the trees are growing up fast in between as well. And three years later, 137 species of birds are living here. So we lower the air temperature, 3 to 5 degrees Celsius. The air humidity is up 10%. Cloud cover, I'm going to show it to you, is up, rainfall is up, and all these species and income. We urgently need to reduce emissions, but also somehow draw down atmospheric carbon. And one great natural technology to do that is in the form of trees and grasses, and to restore uh, soil carbon stores. Uh, that's a, a known kind of technology, natural technology, that, that we need to urgently pursue now. Looking at the above ground part of the plant that most people see and the roots down into the soil, that plant is putting out foods. Every bit of the surface of that plant is pouring out foods to feed the proper sets of microorganisms and the balances that the plant requires. So it's putting out what's called in the scientific world exudates. The fruit, the blossoms, all of the surface leaves, bark, stems, everything on that plant is putting out an exudate for the purpose of growing bacteria and fungi. And that's really the only reason the plant's putting those foods out. Down in the root system, all of the roots, the structural roots, the lateral roots, the root hairs, the finers, they're all putting out foods to feed the bacteria and fungi. And of course, if a plant was putting out food, that would feed a disease-causing organism, the plant would be dead. So when this plant grown its roots through the soil, starts pumping out all this food, the bacteria grow, the fungi grow, and we have now a million, million bacteria per teaspoon of soil around that root system. We have you know, miles and miles and miles of fungal hyphae around the root system. So we've got a castle wall. We're protecting, and if the plants doing that, how's it doing it? Through the exudates, through the foods that it's putting out. Simple sugars, protein, and then carbohydrate. What is that a recipe for? Cakes and cookies. So your plant is dumping cakes and cookies all over its surface, every single surface, putting out cakes and cookies to feed these bacteria and fungi so they grow to really high numbers and are protecting that root system from all of the diseases that would be trying to come in. So in a healthy soil that has the proper set of biology, that plant is going to be able to grow everything it needs to grow to protect that root. And of course, then if we've got all these bacteria and fungi growing, here come the predators of the bacteria and fungi. And when a protozoan eats a bacterium, it releases nutrients in a now plant available form. They release nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, magnesium, calcium, iron, zinc, copper, you name it, the whole list of nutrients that your plant requires. They release those nutrients in a plant available form. As long as we maintain that biology in the soil. But it's also a supply of the electrical uh, circuit for the, for the body. And each individual cell has a cytoskeleton. This is, gives it structure, gives it strength so it doesn't get smashed. But that cytoskeleton is also a source of electricity. The electricity coming in off of the network, traveling through the uh, cytoskeletal fibers to provide electricity to the internal of the cell. So here's a schematic of a simple cell. 
And this cell, you can see these plus signs uh, throughout going along these cytoskeleton pathways, and those are protons. And they're coming in from the outside, but who's making those protons be available? That's the structured water. It surrounds the cell, and the cell works very hard to maintain that structured water, and when there's sunlight, it will grow, and that will make more energy. But the plus signs are gathering along the edge, along the interface of the structured water with the unstructured water outside of it, and they can be channeled up into these cavioli, these little caves, and then brought right into the cytoskeleton to provide those positive charges to certain organelles in the cell that need positive charge. And in particular, one of those is the lysosome. Lysosomes need to be extremely acidic in order to do their job. And their job is to clear molecular debris. Very, very important. Get rid of the garbage. As they draw in these plus signs, these protons, they get lower and lower pH. And now they can do their job. If that electrical circuit is not supplying enough protons, they can't do their job. The debris gathers up, and you get things like Alzheimer's disease from amyloid beta plaque. There's also the mitochondria. Those are their source of energy for the cell. They make the ATP, and they also depend on protons to supply a lower pH in their intracellular membrane compared to the pH in the interior world. They need that pH drop to drive the generation of the ATP that supplies energy for the cell. What I'm saying, and, and the most important thing in this talk, is that structured water that is maintained outside the cell, it's a special gel form of water. It's not liquid, it's not solid. And it also induces this charge separation that creates a battery. And what happens then is that the cell uses those protons to go into the cytoskeleton to supply the positive charge. And the electrons stay inside the structured water. And they provide energy for another very, very important purpose, probably other purposes as well. But one that I'm very focused on is the synthesis of sulfate. And the reason why this is important is because the sulfate actually maintains the gel. Each cell decorates its exterior with lots of sulfates that are attached to these extracellular matrix uh, sugars outside the cell. And those sulfates are really important for maintaining the structured water. So it's circular. They're made by the energy that the structured water creates when it responds to light, and then they maintain the structured water. So when that system falls apart, lots of bad things happen. So, so this is my bold claim, deficiencies in cholesterol and sulfate supplies to the blood and to the tissues are the most important factor behind modern diseases. And I have looked at many, many modern diseases, and I can see that in many cases what's happening is the body is attacking a particular organ or an organ system in order to get at the sulfate that's there, in order to give that sulfate to the blood because the blood is deficient. If the blood doesn't flow, the body doesn't work. So that becomes a number one priority, and various organs get sacrificed. And that will explain different kinds of diseases like um, rheumatoid arthritis and Alzheimer's and autism, particularly glyphosate, which is the one I've studied the most, which is in the pervasive herbicide Roundup that's pervasive in our environment, in our food, in our water. Roundup, I think, is causing a serious problem for ENOS, which is causing us to have this massive sulfate deficiency. Get out in the sunlight as much as you can. I love to take walks on the beach, in the water. Uh, you're getting everything there. You're getting the grounding, you're getting the sunlight, and um, fresh air. In summary, the human body uses sunlight to make sulfate, which maintains gelled water surrounding cells. That gelled water induces charge separation, and that supplies electricity to the tissues. Sulfate is essential to prevent a no-flow situation in the blood. That's why the red blood cells can scoot through so, so easily through the capillaries. It makes the heart sing, because it, has to, it doesn't have to work nearly so hard. Enos is a magical protein that makes sulfate in response to sunlight. But it's highly, highly, highly vulnerable to both deficiencies in certain nutrients and poisoning from various uh, toxic chemicals, especially Roundup. Is, um, Bill Wallison's always not there, not far away. Um, and one of the things that he, one of the sayings that he gave us not long before he died um, was, it's not good enough to be well-intentioned. We must be well-informed. So, so a heritage seed... A heritage seed, to me, is a seed that has grown in a specific place, it's co-evolved in a specific place on Earth in very strong connection and communication with, with the Earth. And so via the microbes in the Earth, via the life in the soil, via the minerals in the life in the soil, there is strong communication. We know that that happens now. And so that builds a strong plant. The plant, as I mentioned before, is able to connect more strongly with the universe. The, the higher the vibration of the plant, the more electrical energy it has, the more it can pull in from the universe. 
the higher its ability is to do that. The stronger connection that plant will have with us. And so a heritage seed is a seed that has the potential to grow into a plant that has always been strongly connected to the earth at a specific place and the people that it has always been in relationship with. Two, two of the most important um, words in the permaculture, well, if, if you're working within the permaculture framework and involved in doing permaculture design, then the two key words that keep coming up for me all the time is diversity and integration. And so our heritage seeds were the seed, are seeds that contain an enormous diversity of genetic material and are the, that that have co-evolved in the place where we garden and where we live and that are the most strongly integrated, connected to all the elements of that ecology. So they are, heritage seeds are about resilience, they're about food security and they're also the seeds because they have the greater ability to connect with the earth and with the communication and the microbes and all the life in the earth and the universe, they grow to be higher bricks, more nutrient dense they have. Um, and because of that, they're capable of sequestering more carbon and growing soil. So our heritage seeds are essentially an element in the circle of life that is regenerative. Heritage seeds are capable of regenerating humans, and the earth. So there's a new science called epigenetics and it's a, it's a 10 or 20 years old. It's come out of the science of genetics and at the point where scientists came to understand that they could identify and name all, the, all, our, all our bits of DNA, they also came to understand 20 years ago or so that the DNA can't turn itself on and off and they didn't know what did control the genes. So epigenetics is the science that's come out of genetics and epigenetics means what's above the genes or what controls the genes. So you know when we um, when we when we use the word epigenetics I see in my mind's eye the double helix spiral we've got on the screen there and so 20 years or so ago the scientists didn't understand um, they knew that the actual DNA and that double helix spiral was only a, made up only a tiny part of that double helix spiral and they didn't understand the function of the rest of that double helix spiral so ironically enough now they called it the junk dna so most of that double helix spiral is made up of what's called the junk dna and they didn't know its function then but we do now and so the function of that part of our dna which was called the junk dna we now know that its function is it's that part of our body that communicates with our food, with not just our food, but at the environment we provide for our body. So that's our food, it's, it's a lot of it can be food, but it's also the water we drink and the air we breathe and the thoughts we have and the friends we have, the whole environment, stress, the work we do, everything. All of that affects the communication with our junk DNA and places t um, tags on our DNA. So our interaction with our environment, the interaction between our DNA and the environment we live in, places tags on our DNA. And those tags, if, if the communication has been strong and clear, we'll have strong and clear tags placed on our DNA. And so those are the tags on this double helix spiral that are strong and they have not full of holes. You know, if we are eating high bricks food with high levels of balanced minerals, you know, grown in microbially active and alive soils and really clear, clean water with no chlorine in it and fluorine in it. And, um, and you know, if we are, have work that we love and we've got a good, you know, we're eating the Western Price traditional diet, lots of high, um, high levels of traditional fats and oils, you know, um, lots of minerals and vitamins we're eating good food we're going to get clear strong tags placed on our junk dna and if we're eating processed food food that has um, been homogenized food that has been pasteurized food that has been extended food that's got ge ingredients if we're eating food that is um it's not highly mineralized it's not 
vibrating at a high level, it's not going to communicate with our junk DNA clearly. So then we see the holy tags, the sort of miscommunication. Holy tags get placed on our junk DNA and then they get placed on our, they send messages to our DNA, which determines how our DNA expresses. So the environment we provide determines eventually the messages that get sent to our DNA, which determines how our DNA expresses. What makes us strong and what makes our ecosystem strong and is, is the web of life. It's, it's diversity and integration again and again and again. Everywhere we look, it's about diversity and integration. So if we want to be um, supporting the web of wife, life, I always see it as a blanket. So we've got a multicolored, beautiful, strong, hand-woven blanket, you know, from some amazing um, indigenous tribe somewhere on earth, where we, or even like in New Zealand, a beautiful kitty or a beautiful hand-woven um, harakiki garment or anything where there are lots and lots of threads in the warp and lots of threads in the weft and they're tightly woven and they're colourful and there's different textures and there's different colours. That is a strong, resilient thing, whatever it is. It's strong and resilient and beautiful and feels good and it supports what's around it. But if we start pulling out any of those threads, it becomes weaker and weaker and weaker and we have less diversity and we connectedness, less communication, and less integration. So we're at a crossroads right now on Earth where, we, where we've pulled out so many trees, we've lost so many um, species, they're, they're disappearing every day, our seeds are down to like somewhere between one and five percent of what we had, you know, 150 years ago. So we're on a strong path to degeneration. And what this journey of the seeds has got to be all about, it's, it's about more than just the seeds. It's about the seeds are part. We need the seeds to be part of a regenerative way of living. My philosophy about what to do in the world isn't go to a pristine area and live there and enjoy your life. It's to find a place that's degraded and fix it up. Twenty-three years ago we started developing the food forest system here. A food forest is a permanent planting, so you want to set up a, just like a forest system. The big trees and the middle sized trees and the bottom layer and the ground layer, they work together. Some plants pick up some minerals and give others back and another one does something else. It's really lovely to put them together and create a, a, a forest system that's for birds and insects and for us. We've got uh, 480 different species of plants at last count. That, that doesn't include the 80 different types of apples and the you know, 60 different types of gooseberries. Growing out in the forest garden there, aside from the native trees which I've used as a framework or a platform for building everything else, and those provide me with shelter from the wind and also nest sites for the birds and the birds are a really important player in the management of the garden. In the second layer down to that, we have our fruit tree layer, which is our heritage apples and pears and plums and nectarines and peaches, apricots, those kinds of production trees, I suppose you'd call them, but that's not really how I think of them. In our forest garden, I've got about 120 fruit trees. Um, there are uh, 80 different apple trees alone of all different names that I've got from the old heritage orchards. The apple trees are a special favourite of mine because each one has a different uh, story and history and some are uh, more than 500 years old. And below that a layer of um, berry fruits and currants, red currants, black currants, white currants, gooseberries, Worcester berries, all of those sorts of shrubby um, uh, plants that like to grow in the semi-shade. The um, biennial and perennial herbs, some of which are edible, some of which are medicinal. And then below that there are bulbs and root crops that grow such as parsnips and, and, um, and wild carrots, those kinds of things. And then w winding their way up through these things are vines like grape vines and kiwi fruit and Manchurian gooseberries and hops and, and all sorts of things which kind of bind everything together and, and tie the forest um, tie the forest together. So what I've tried to do where the house is now was completely covered in junk 
and the remains of the old house that had um, caught fire. So most people would have not even crossed the threshold of the property to, to have a look at that, I don't think, because it didn't look very appealing. But to us it did, because I thought, well, for one thing, nobody wants it, so it's probably going to be cheap, and it was, um, cheap to buy. And secondly, I thought, I can fix this. And now it is this beautiful open stream running across a rocky bed and even a spring over here to my left. With that in place and opened and planted out, I noticed that there were fish swimming in it, swimming upstream. And really, the, your responsibility becomes learning more about how that works, stepping back, being a bit more relaxed about the whole thing and just watching those processes and, and, and even changing the way that you think about harvest and about what you eat or what you need from your garden. And so your diet could change, as ours has, and rather than looking to eat lettuces, we might eat uh, Alexander's or a perennial um, French sorrel. I think it's the invitation for some wildness to come into your garden, forest, um, and play its part because that's the most powerful factor in any um, growing situation like this is what's going to happen anyway, what the natural world's going to bring to you. In terms of making a positive change in the world, creating a forest garden has to be one of the most effective things a person, a community or a city council can do, especially if it's done in a way that respects the wild rhythms of the world and doesn't fight natural processes. the water doesn't evaporate so everything's lush and green inside there so we want to recreate that instead of this desert we live in and the heat we have to use lots of water and everything the plants are actually growing better but until these trees become fully established and they will shade everything we came up here at the school with what we call crit boring shade we started with sunflowers and this year we added sunchoke we have moisture our lettuce doesn't bolt so we decided, let's try some tropical plants, like the Polynesians. We have taro root. Look at this gorgeous oh, wow. taro root. It came back from last year. It literally insulated through the winter and came back and sprouted through all the winter. And I was like, boy, are you a hardy tropical plant. So now I want to learn not only how to grow fruit and vegetables for my family, but to do it in a way that's sustainable. And I grew up back east where water isn't a problem, but living in Utah where we have drought conditions, um, it poses different challenges That's to true. growing, and so I'm really interested in learning So tell us what you learned, what you designed to do that here at the school. Well, I learned how to um, design my garden in a way where the water, water will naturally flow to it, and so I was able to survey my spot and determine the best way to situate the garden so that for maximum water um, flow to it. And <laughs> but What did um, you design in and already put in your garden? 
So I've already been putting in some layered beds and trenches. Um, I'm working on my downspout off a structure that's in my yard, but I've got about five different beds that have, um, you know, varying layers of raw materials. I have one bed saved out that I'm going to put in the Hubel bed. Okay. Hey my name is Neil Spackman. Uh, I work in Saudi Arabia. I run a terraforming program there, working with tribes of settled nomads. Wow. We, uh, essentially what we do is we take uh, watersheds and convert sections of the desert into forests and use that as an economic base for the people living there. We're seven years into work on our 100 acre prototype. We've got 5,000 acres under development and a request from some of the uh, surrounding magistrates or governorates to take a few more sites to develop those as well. Um, permaculture is kind of the the foundation of the ideas, the foundation for our approach is largely permaculture based. And they're going to be on the right. You'll see some taro on the left. And just kind of feel what it feels like in here, okay? Because I didn't get to take you in the other one. So come through here. So stay right in here where you feel the coolness. Do you guys feel what it feels like in here? Isn't it wonderful? And that's when my hazelnuts started to grow faster and their leaves weren't drying out as bad in the heat of the hot sun in the summer. That's when the taro loved it in here. That's when a lot of plants started to really thrive. And I was like, oh, I love this effect I created with these temporary shade plants, right, of the sunchokes. I can't wait until everything starts to shade. Don't you love the golden raspberries? Look at them up there. We just love all the different kind of berries you can grow in here. This is a bush cherry. I'll show you on the other side some red cornelian cherries. I've got yellow cornelian cherries over here. We just try everything and we'll see what, what works, right? What, what survives. So my big one was planted from a pit apricot oh, 12 years ago. Yeah, that's my planted from a pit favorite apricot right there. I love them. Well, I mean, the ecological part is great. It's fun. It's beautiful. And it is. it'll develop more and more. It will. But I'm learning as I go. Yes. Yeah, I'm just learning as I go. That's all we can do, right? Is just keep learning what works, what doesn't. I've got teachers already contacting me and saying, can you come to this class? Can you come to this? And, yeah. and then we'll, we want to do a project and learn about nature. Can our, our students come here? Totally free. The movement that we're building here together is about bringing back hope. It's about bringing back a purpose in life. The biggest problem that exists on our planet Earth now is climate change. So as a result, we're facing so many problems, but the solution to them is the same. We start restoring the ecology, the ecosystems. If we apply regenerative techniques to bring it back to life, this is enough to reverse climate change. The purpose of ecosystem restoration camps is to restore land that has been degraded by humans. What we need to do is go to the historically degraded landscapes, which were once the Garden of Eden. Volunteers can come from around the world, or they can be local community members, volunteering five hours a day, helping to restore the planet. We are ecosystem restoration camps. You're not waiting for somebody else to do the work. You join a group that is actually restoring this planet. I quit my studies to come here to do a little bit of service, to give myself to the planet. This is the thing that I wanted to do. This is the tribe that I want to join. Can be a solution bigger than the things that I can do alone. This, this is where I want to be. This is what I want to be doing. We need to stand up together. We're, we're a new international of green-minded people. It's, it's a viral concept. That's why it's so strong. It starts with one camp. A lot of people going through that camp they bring the idea home, they may start new camps. We go from a very degraded ecosystem back to a fully functional ecosystem. Everybody opened their eyes and they're like, oh, it's that simple. Desert used to be productive lands and could be made productive again. It is possible to change a landscape from a desert and to completely re-green it so that there's food, water, and, and wildlife in abundance. A great place to learn. Uh, how to grow food, how to become more self-sufficient. 
Soil is the basis of life. If you have a, a soil that has no life, nothing good can grow from there. Well, by restoring the ecosystem, which involves restoring the soil, adding more organic matter to the soil and more life, uh, that soil will hold the water much longer, will hold much more nutrients, and that way bring back fertility. As we start planting trees, we start taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, we, we start that process of reversing climate change. This area in Spain, for example, is, uh, is one of the most abandoned areas in Spain. Degradation of the, of the ecosystem mirrors in the degradation of society. It's not just about restoring the land, it's also about restoring, restoring the societies, restoring people. It would be cool. Let's, let's kind of bring back the spirit of, of childhood, of game, but of projects, of doing things together. I think that the, the camp will bring back that possibility of playing like a kid, but with a purpose. So then we want to restore the earth. We want to live in the beautiful paradise that the earth is. Come to ecosystem restoration camps and make part of the solution. Join other like-minded people who say, yeah, we can do it. We can reverse this biggest problem ever existed.